and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. Like what you hear? Click the thumbs up. Don't care for it? Click the thumbs down. Good luck to all of our contestants. On the Mundane Applications of Extraordinary Inventions Written by Phil Margolis Performed by Chadrick McNeil For Chilling Tales for Dark Nights And the Evil Idol Competition Looping through the streets designed by Escher, I realized the reason Roberta moved here. Because C lives in McLean Ritz. Of course, Roberta had to retire to a community scattershot with over-designed and underbuilt refugees from Levittown. The thought distracts me as I slide the car to a halt at another stop sign. I quit the drone of NPR's Science Friday and let the strum of rain provide background noise. I wish I could kill the hypnotic swish of the wipers, but then I would have to drive even slower. Roberta is all about time. Punctuality is the only virtue in her world. Just in time, I locate the right driveway. My headlights sweep across the crew-cut lawn before focusing on the explosion of shop tools, discarded wires, and metal plating that clutter her garage. In the center of it all stands her masterwork, which looks just like an early space capsule. Odd choice, I mutter as I dash for the garage. Roberta works behind a makeshift console topped by a plexiglass shield, screwing in a big red button with a power driver. The console looks like a homemade version of Mission Control, which it is, kind of, if Roberta is telling the truth. Ray, watch out for that cable, Roberta says without glancing up. I don't want you to damage it. I tiptoe across the minefield of debris, stopping beside the capsule. Built by a Niven fan, it looks so Bradbarian. Constructed of corrugated sheets and copper wiring, with store-bought nuts and bolts, with hopes and dreams, and a lot of sweat. Ironically, like the early science experiments of the American rocket program, I decide it matches most closely a Gemini capsule. Of course, its supposed function is along a different vector. Why is there no sense of irony here? A woman who is obsessed with timeliness built a time machine in her garage. Only Roberta. I ease over to stand across the plexiglass shield from her. I wave my hand at all of it. Deeper meaning here? I'm no minion of the people with eyes only for dollars and cents. She sticks her hands into the pockets of her mottled lab coat and stares at me. I feel like the victim of a full sensor sweep. That's why I've done the impossible. Roberta makes a show of checking her watch. Typical. She's 26 minutes late. Drama and showmanship over promptness and courtesy. I let the insult lie. Well, after Zack picks up C, he's got to drive through the rain from McLean. For someone who writes about time travel, too often our dear Isaac fails to grasp the concept of travel time. Abandoning me, she walks around the capsule. It still seems like a science fiction story. And I thought Isaac was the author. He writes fiction. I'm a journalist. There's a difference, she says as she reappears. Turning away from the insult, I look out the garage door. The rain drizzles to an end. The setting sun peeks out from the sliver of sky chopped up by ticky-tack boxes with a glandular problem. I use that line once in an article on developments like this. Roberta closes the garage door. Almost time. As if coincidence were eavesdropping, the glare of headlights swings into the high garage windows as an oversized SUV pulls into the driveway beside my car. Roberta and I thread our way to the door into the house, where the design aesthetic left behind in the 1960s assaults us. Odd considering the house is no more than a decade old, but I have come to learn that odd to us is status quo to Roberta. The aroma of chocolate chip peanut butter cookies rises as I follow her to the kitchen. She pulls the tray from the oven and sets it on the counter to cool, then puts on a tea kettle. Amused by the domesticity, I loiter in the doorway trying to think of something witty with a bite, but not outright insulting to say. 
Roberta breezes past me. There's a polite knock at the door before we even enter the living room. Roberta opens the door just as Zack reaches to knock again. The drizzle has started again. C, a hand's breadth taller than Zack, holds the umbrella to cover both of them. Dr. Hines, Zack says. Hello, Isaac. Senator, I say from behind Roberta. Oh, Ray, not that from you. C, Senator, says Roberta. Roberta. C collapses the umbrella and saunters in, her senatorial blouse and ankle-length skirt forming the perfect counterpoint to Roberta's lab coat hiding a discount rack outfit. Zack skips in around closing the door. Your severance from Princeton couldn't have bought you a real house, C says. You've evolved a sense of humor since school. With that granite shell around it, it's too bad your ex-husband wasn't a geologist. The initial insults issued. The women establish their positions across the coffee table, while the men retreat to the kitchen to fetch the tea. What first salvo launched their never-ending war? Neither of them ever told to me or Zack. We tried not to imagine. Or rather, we pretended not to anymore. Their four years together as college roommates had blasted them onto different journeys that carried them to the heights of their chosen professions. Roberta blended the four major fields of physics, classical and relativistic mechanics with quantum field theory and mechanics, to establish her own realm of study just because C had once proclaimed that such a feat was improbable. Unfortunately, once Princeton grew the same conviction, even tenure did not save Roberta's career. Cecilia Clark climbed the political tree into the rarefied branches of the Senate, where she sought out committee assignments that had the most direct effect on Roberta's funding. Her own career arced over, though, once the taxpayers decided she was too much a one-note song. In her two dozen years in Congress, C never missed an opportunity to deny Roberta at every turn. Even at her last hearing on her final day in office, C cast the killing vote on a funding bill that included a minuscule line for some obscured project Roberta championed. The whistle from the kettle shields us from the continued sarcastic rhetoric assaulting our ears. I hesitate before popping the valve. Zack shuffles cookies from the tray onto a plate. Time machine, huh? That's what Roberta claims. Hell of a story for both of us if she's telling the truth. The first draft of history is often stranger than fiction, I say. How did you convince C to come? She's writing her memoir. All I had to say was, why invent details when the truth can be much sweeter? You're evil, I say with a laugh, then snatch a cookie off his plate. The women don't let our tea service interrupt their argument, which at the moment is over the dispensation or lack thereof of internet services in third world countries. C, as her voting record proves, is all for helping other countries build infrastructure and supporting other basic needs. Roberta is too, as I recall, but to hear her argue against the idea is to believe she's an Ayn Rand heir. As I listen, though, I realize how their enmity has evolved. Then it was more of a passion that defined their lives. Now, it's like watching some twisted versions of Harry Potter and Voldemort, who would commit suicide just to see the other perish as well. Weariness is etched on their faces, as if exhausted from battle. They fight only because they are too dogmatic to stop. Zack and I settle ourselves and chit-chat about lesser issues. Travails of the local sports teams, faltering congressional ratings, and being the D.C. metro area are day jobs. To ignore a sarcastic quip from Roberta, C. slides her droid out and studies the time. Getting late. Have you forgotten your reason for dragging us out here? I forget nothing. Roberta is halfway to the door before the rest of us could blink. More exhausted than reluctant, Zack and I trail C. into the garage. This is it. C says, muffling her irritation. A calculated glare scans every inch of the capsule. This is it, Roberta declares. She dives into a practice speech, pointing out all the little mechanisms and theories that are supposed to make her contraption work. Then she opens the hatch to point out every nuance, including a matching operator console and leather seats, with room enough for three people. A seat and a seat belt, C notes. How safety conscious of you. Wouldn't want anyone to get hurt. Zack pulls an instruction manual out of the capsule. Flipping through it, he peppers Roberta with questions. 
but her responses are more like a child playing with a puppy than the repost with C. Think it'll work? Zack asks me as we gather at the console. Roberta does. Think it'll blow us up? C asks. Wouldn't be here if I did. My mind is not as sure as my voice. C turns to Roberta, who ignores us as she fiddles with the controls. So we're your guinea pigs? Oh no, Zack says. I don't actually do the things I write about. It's science fiction. I thought you didn't believe it'll work, C says. Ray? A nervous laugh escapes my lips. I requested an assignment in Des Moines for the duration of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Men, C says. Roberta strangles back a smile. We men, our loafers cemented firmly to the concrete floor, turn to her. Volunteering? Roberta lets the smile out as she faces C. Oh, of course, what a perfect way to kill somebody, C says in mock belief. Send me back in time and let a T-Rex do your dirty work. How convenient. Roberta snorts. I can think of a lot more inventive ways to kill you. Besides, time travel, according to my theory, and of course I'm right, ironically only lets us send things into the future, not the past. C looks to Zack and then me, studying us. Her face is transparent to her thoughts. She's thinking, Roberta wouldn't let Zack and Ray be here if she was planning something. She's thinking, Zack and Ray wouldn't let anything happen to me. I hope she's right. Okay, I'll play your game, she says, staring Roberta dead in the eyes. In my mind, she's Matt Smith's doctor, surrounded by stone angels declaring, There's one thing you never ever put in a trap, if you're smart. Me. I hope she's right. She plucks the manual from Zack. Back behind the safety glass with the coward and the mad scientist. Not too far into the future, Roberta dear. C walks to the capsule. I don't want to miss next year's Game of Thrones premiere. I wouldn't worry. You'll be traveling at the nominal rate of one second per second. I think one hour should suffice. C smiles at Zack. I think that chapter will pretty much write itself. She slides into the capsule and closes the door behind her with an echoing clang. Roberta starts explaining every push button and twisted knob to Zack in a techno gibberish that sounds like pseudoscience to me. Zack's eyes glaze over as Roberta details each step. Three minutes later, Roberta taps in the final sequence and pushes the big red button. Nothing happens. At first. C tries to open the door, but it won't budge. I start for the capsule, but Roberta holds me back with a hand on my chest. She's grinning like the Cheshire cat. There are no great sparks, no whirlwind whipping up our hair Don King style. The air around the capsule becomes hazy, like heat off hot pavement, blurring around the edges, breaking down into static. Then I realize the capsule is vibrating, as if the very atoms are jittering a trillion times a second. Faster, faster it quivers until the entire capsule is a blur of blues and golds. Sweat seeps onto my face. It's like standing too close to a barbecue. The whine of an electric beater creeps to my ears, rising in volume and pitch. The room goes white. When I open my eyes, the capsule is gone. Only a blackened splotch on the floor remains where it stood. Roberta is yanking my arm and tapping her chest. Her mouth moves, but no sound comes out. Faintly, the whine still echoes, like mattresses cover my ears. I did it, Roberta mouths. Wait a minute, Roberta, Zack whispers, or at least it seems like he's whispering. He's probably shouting. You said you kept the spatial coordinates the same, and only vary the temporal coordinate, right? Correct? Same place, new time. Zack's jaw lowers, but it's a moment before he speaks. You sent her to this location in the past? Or was it in the future? How do you do research if you don't pay attention, Zack? The future. But, but in the future, this location, that spot in your garage, isn't in the same position with respect to the Earth, which won't be in the same position with respect to the Sun or the rest of the universe. Did you take that into account? Roberta tips her head and looks at him like a tenured professor lecturing a kindergartner. Yes, of course I did, Zack. She looks to me for commentary. 
I offer the words that struck me the moment she told me about her time capsule and invitation to see. You're more interested in irony than morality. Is that such a bad thing? Murder is murder. My voice is a whisper, or at least I think it is. War is not the only field littered with casualties. Zack is still catching up. But, but then, but the capsule would materialize in, in space, with the Earth an hour ahead in its orbit. Yes, Zack. No, I choose to believe Roberta cannot become that twisted by her rivalry with C. There has to be something I missed. Well, all she would have to do is reset the temporal coordinates, I ask, semi-sure of the answer to my leading question. And come back here, right? Roberta frowns at me, and I feel like a slacker freshman again. So much for you being the observant one, Ray. Time travel only works one way, remember? Into the future. Then how does she get back, Roberta? Zack asks. He still doesn't get it. That capsule was not designed for space. Zack's eyes widen like the disk of the moon. That's murder. The capsule's integrity will keep her safe for a month or so. And she was always a whiz at math. She can send herself further into the future, trying to guess when the Earth will be under her feet. Otherwise, there are enough telescopes looking up. I'm sure someone will notice her floating out there. Sooner or later. She grins bared teeth at me. More inventive ways. I did warn her. I blink and stare, my head automatically nodding. Something bothers me, though, but I can't quite catch the thought. Zack's jaw works, but his larynx doesn't. His eyes turn to me, begging for answers. We're all in this together now, I tell myself. Zack and I are now accessories to the murder. Correction, the disappearance of an ex-senator. We probably ought to make up a story out of sight, since no one would believe a truth that is literally out there. A novelist and a journalist, I'm sure, can concoct an appropriately well-written fiction. My eyes shift to the charred spot where the capsule sat. Strange to think that C is there, but not there. Then the thought coalesces and grabs my full attention. Um, Roberta? Roberta, staring back at the black spot lost in self-adulation, notices me again. Yes, Ray? She sounds bored. Or tired. You said the capsule remains in the same place in space and only moves in time, right? Yes, Ray. Her tone trends toward irritation. What was your coordinate system? What are you babbling on about? Her face reddens and her voice hardens. What was your origin of your coordinate system? Was it relative or absolute? She looks at me like I'm stupid, then gestures to a spot on the floor. Simple enough. Did you consider that the origin is not fixed in space, that it moves with the earth? Her mouth creeps open and her eyes go wide as she turns to the exact spot on the planet where the time capsule is, or rather will be again in about 55 minutes. Her face goes from a healthy beige to the color of glue. Thank God for you, Ray, Zack says, tugging Luce's collar and slouching against the console. We just have to wait a little while and then all is good. Why wait, Roberta says, picking up a wrench and tossing it onto the burnt spot in her garage. In a moment, she's all over the room, grabbing boxes and more tools, any little thing she can lay a hand on, and tosses them on the spot where the capsule will be. Let's change the parameters of the test. A rosy tint refills her face. I've always been curious about the uncertainty principle on a macro scale. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already... Don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. By doing so, you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on August 15th, based on your votes, the top 25 contestants will advance to the third round, which begins September 1st, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.